is a typical general purpose saddle which is pulling the rider out of alignment the leg is being pulled forward by the stirrup bar being too far forward on the saddle so that the whole rider's position is actually out of balance and if you took the horse and the saddle or the machine and the saddle away from underneath her she would land sitting on her backside and not standing on her feet with her feet uh, her knees slightly bent which is the uh, position that we would be landing in if you're in the correct ear shoulder hip heel line of balance for me the most important thing when we're looking at um, teaching people to ride is the absorption of the movement from the absorption of the movement comes balance and from balance comes position but if the saddle is pulling the rider out of balance all of the time uh, neither position nor balance are going to be possible. So if only saddlers would realise what they're actually doing to the rider, and so many riders you'll hear the instructors saying to them, lower leg back, lower leg back, when in fact it's the saddle that's pulling the rider out of balance. And if the rider is not a strong rider, particularly somebody who's maybe only riding once or twice a week at a riding school, or if uh, only riding once a day, perhaps on their own horse, they will not develop the musculature and poise to be able to balance in a saddle of this um, construction and so if the rider were actually to have her legs in the correct position to put her in the ear shoulder hip heel line if we can just move Laura here we'll take her feet out of the stirrups a moment and then if I bring her leg back to where she should be you've got your backside stuck out a little bit underneath you Laura if we just bring your legs up over the front of the saddle yeah slide your bum forward a little bit now drop your legs back down again okay now if we have a look at her, she's more or less in the ear, shoulder, hip, heel line of balance but the whole knee roll at the front there is sticking out in front of her and with riders with very large thighs, the thigh would actually be off the back of the saddle so that there's no support for the thigh whatsoever. So merely putting the rider in that position, she's going to have to hold the leather back. You notice the stirrup leather is hanging there, several inches in front of her leg and it means she's got to hold it back at a 45 degree angle if she is to actually maintain that position of balance. This is a fairly typical general purpose saddle and you can see that the deepest most central part of the saddle which is where the rider should sit is actually quite out of line with the stirrup bars which are much further forward so that when the rider sits in that part of the saddle the thigh is automatically pulled forward by the stirrup bar and the rider then has to hold the stirrup leather back a 45 degree angle. Also, if we can just bring this into shot in the camera, you can see that where the rider's seat bones would sit, if this is the deepest, most central part of the saddle, they're going to be on either side of the hard slope of the tree. And consequently, the rider can end up with very sore seat bones and tries to push the seat then back towards the, um, the cantle of the saddle in order to avoid the pressure on the seat bones. This then compounds the, the whole position and makes the rider sit in the seat known as the chair seat so that the, the rider's behind is well back on the saddle here and the thigh pulled forward so that the rider is completely then out of the ear, shoulder, hip, heel line of balance. Okay, we'll bring another saddle into the picture and if we just bring this one, which is one of my own Vogue saddles, this is a soft tree saddle which means that it hasn't got any hard structure in the um, construction of the saddle. It is uh, composed of various layers of shock absorbing and pressure absorbing materials and it then flexes with the whole back of the horse. We'll just take this knee roll off for the moment and you can see that the stirrup bar is much further back. On the other saddle it was positioned here but if you look at the deepest most central part of the seat of this saddle here the rider's thigh is then going to be able to hang much more vertically without any effort right. on the part of the rider. Okay, the rider's back needs to be able to flex and straighten in order to absorb the up and down movement of the horse's back because if not the rider will bounce in the saddle and by flexing the lower back in exactly the same way as we do when we walk or run which we'll demonstrate in a minute it means that the movement of the horse is absorbed so that the rider's seat remains on the same plane as the horse's back. Now in walk the movement is one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Just as when we're walking on foot, except for the fact that we're sitting on our seat bones rather than walking on our feet. But the movement of the hips is exactly the same as you would make if you're walking on foot. In sitting trot the movement is twice as fast. It's one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. 
Whoops, Laura's trying to resist me here a bit. If I can just stop her a minute there again, it's much easier once we start the machines. But it's easier to just describe it at the halt before we start the simulator. So it's one, two, one, two, one, two. And that is in actual fact the same movement that you make when you're running on foot. And the faster you run, the, the longer the stride you take, the more your back will flex in. Very much the same as if we're trying to absorb the movement in extended trot on a horse. Or if you were running on the spot, it would make a very small movement, very much like we would be making if we were riding a horse in PF, which is a trot on the spot. So the, the amount of flexion that the back has to make is dictated entirely by amount, the amount the horse's back is either moving up and down or moving forward. So in walk and trot, then this is the movement. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Now, many people in sitting trot tend to drive with both seat bands together, which if I do that, you can see how much the rest of the body wibbles and wobbles and moves all over the place. The lower legs start to flat because what happens is as I push Laura's back in, her seat bones slide forward together. As I pull it back out again, the seat bones slide back together. And so the knees drop down as the seat bones slide forward and the knees come up again as the seat bones slide back. Consequently, the lower leg flaps like that and the movement starts to be absorbed here through the neck and the shoulders. Consequently, you get this horrible nodding head um, that happens often in dressage riders and the whole body seems to be moving so much more. Now, if I just stabilize her position again there and just ask her to move the seat bones unilaterally, left and right, left and right, just watch, you're still holding back a bit there. Just allow me to move your pelvis. One, two, one, two, one, two. Everything stays still. The legs stay still, the hands stay still. Note how the hands tend to also jiggle up and down if I make the rider move both seat bones backwards and forwards together. But as soon as we start to make the much smaller movement with the lower back and the pelvis, then the hands stay still, the lower legs stay still. And if the machine had a belly that would swing the way that the horse's belly swings, the legs would move from side to side, just swinging with the belly so that the legs won't ping off the horse's sides at all.